Thanks everyone for joining us this afternoon. Um, I'd like to turn it over to Mr. Peter Wickham, our moderator for this event. Thank you again. Okay, good. Good afternoon, everyone. And I want to welcome you all to this uh, Financing for Development High Level side event, which is entitled Debt for Climate Swaps for Small Island Development States, an Innovative Approach to Developing a SIDS Debt Crisis. Uh, this session is, of course, hosted by the Antigua Barbuda Chairmanship of the Alliance of Small Island Developing States, which is, of course, focused on the effect of climate change on small island coastal countries. My name is Peter Wickham, and I'm happy that I have the opportunity to host this important forum that brings together a considerable panel with, uh, or should I say a panel with considerable intellectual muscle, as well as experience in the relevant areas that can bring that to bear on these important issues. Um, the approach, I plan to introduce the panel initially, and thereafter I'll invite their contributions that will be followed by an interactive and spirited conversation. And hopefully we'll get some questions from the select audience that is watching this event. Uh, the panel includes both presenters as well as discussants, and they will be introduced in relation to the particular role that they will be uh, taking uh, accordingly. Uh, just to explain to you who uh, is here, we have Dr. Walton Webson. He is Ambassador Extraordinary and Plenipotentiary, Permanent Representative of Antigua and Barbuda to the United Nations since 2014. Uh, since his ap appointment, Ambassador Webson has served as President of UNICEF 2017, Vice President of UNICEF's Board in 2016, and President of the Board of the UNDP UN OPS and UN FPA in 2020. He's currently co-chair of the UN Steering Committee on the SIDS. In 2017, Ambassador Webson was the lead voice on the initiative for raising pledges in support of a global response to the needs of the Caribbean to Hurricane Irma and Maria. And this attracted more than $2.1 million in pledges. And we're happy that he continues to sit on several UN committees, including those responding to COVID-19 challenges, which now present um, small island developing states with a whole new set of challenges. Now we have Her Excellency, Ms. Fakita Okotomayo, uh, Under Secretary General of the Office of the High Representative for Least Developed Countries, Landlocked Developing Countries and Small Island Developing States. Ms. Okotomayo is a Tongan national who took up her appointment in, uh, as high representative for the LDCs and uh, lesser LDCs uh, um, and SIDS in May 2017. Ms. Okutumayo has a wealth of national, regional and international experience at various senior leadership levels. And during her time at the USG, she has been champion of many core issues for SIDS. And we have Her Excellency, Ms. Diane Black Lane, Ms. Black Lane is an Antigua and Barbuda Ambassador for Climate Change and Chair of the AO, AOASIS for Climate Change. Uh, Ambassador Black Lane has been in the field of environment management for over 20 years, and she's currently the Director of Antigua and Barbuda's Development of the Environment, DOE. She has extensive experience in climate finance and has served as a GCF board member. She's led the DOE to accreditation with multiple funds. And during the last two years of the DOE has raised financing from the IRENA, GEF, GCF, and the Adaptation Fund. Then we have His Excellency, Mr. Bob K. Ray. Mr. Ray is uh, the ambassador and permanent representative of Canada to the United Nations in New York. Mr. Ray served as premier of Ontario from 1990 to 1995, and interim leader of the Liberal Party of Canada from 2011 to 2013. He was elected to federal and provincial parliaments 11 times between 1978 and 2013, and has been named the Queen's Council in 1984. Mr. Ray is a Privy Councillor, a Companion of the Order of Canada, a member of the Order of Ontario, and has numerous awards and honorary degrees from institutions from Canada and around the world. And we have Ms. Babita Bishit. Ms. Bishit is the Deputy Director of External Relations on lead, sorry, and lead on strategic outreach and partnerships, <clears throat> excuse me, 
at the GCF responsible for resource mobilizations and communications. <clears throat> Previously, she was seconded by the UNICEF and the United Nations General Emergency Response Fund as the chief of resource mobilizations and communications. And under her leadership, the CERF achieved the highest income in its 12 year history. Ms. Bashit has worked as the executive manager of the partnerships portfolio of the UNICEF office of the executive director and experience covers humanitarian development, peace building and climate change related responses and challenges. Then we have Ms. Yolanda Freshnio. Ms. Freshnio, Senior Policy and Advocacy Officer at Eurodad, the European Network on Debt and Development, working on debt justice, was also involved in the Spanish Citizens Debt Audit Program and worked for more than 10 years as a researcher at Debt Observatory in Barcelona as an outreach consultant and MSF, Transnational Institute and several local authorities in Catalonia and Spain, both on international development finance and on local public policy, which included gender budgeting and gender public procurement. She was an MA in development, cooperation and a BA in sociology, both of which are from the University of Barcelona. Then we have Dr. Carl Frederick Schleichner. Uh, Dr. Schleichner is head of climate science and impacts climate analytics has long-standing experience in climate modeling and climate impact science. Multi-year experience in providing scientific evidence at the climate policy interface, including the UNFCC process, a climate physicist by training, and he's received a PhD with distinction uh, at the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research. And his publication record spans a wide range from climate extreme and climate impact projections, including water availability and food production to tipping elements and societal implications of climate change. He's also published more than 60 peer reviewed publications, book chapters and reports. And then finally, we have Ms. Teresa Beck, uh, not least a research analyst, climate analytics, focusing on climate risk and adaptation. She works on extreme weather events and associated losses within a project of the Network for Greening and Financial System. She's worked on climate, disaster risk management with the disaster risk reduction section of the United Nations ESCAP in Thailand and the JITS in Germany. So ladies and gentlemen, we have a fairly, a very well experienced qualified panel that will uh, assist us this morning, uh, this afternoon, I'm sorry. I will begin with introductory remarks from His Excellency Dr. Walton Webson. Uh, who is permanent representative of Antigua and Barbuda to the United Nations. Dr. Webster. Thank you very much, Peter. <laughs> Thank you very much, Peter. And what a pleasure to be um, on the same virtual platform with you. I listen to you often and um, it's, it's, a real, it's a real honor. Excellencies, Under Secretary General Komodo, colleagues, let me begin first by thanking you all, each of you, for taking time to be here with us today. My opening remarks will be very, I will try to make them very quick because we have a very large and extensive panel. As you all know, the COVID-19 pandemic has laid bare the, the precise nature of the vulnerabilities of, of small island developing states that we have been speaking about this for decades. We have been speaking of our vulnerability. The pandemic continues to have unprecedented impacts on SIDS. Our health systems are heavily burdened and strained. Our economies are on the verge of collapse and the overall toll <clears throat> of our development is in tatters. It is incalculable. As I said last week, in our situation, our situation is dire. We are squeezed on all sides. Yet, due to the arbitrary designation of us as middle income states, many of us are told that we do not need or qualify for assistance. This is ludicrous. In a year when our 
debt to GDP ratios are beyond maxed out. And when even in the best of times, a hurricane can easily wipe out an entire year's GDP in one fell swoop. I just want you to stop and think for a minute and ref reflect on our brothers and sisters in St. Vincent and the Grenadines and some of the neighboring islands and to think of the tragedy that has yet again brought an island nation to its knees in one short moment. In addition to the debt crisis we face, we are also facing the onslaught of climate crisis. Sadly, friends, the scientist community is predicting an extremely busy and overactive hurricane season for 2021. This is right upon us. While we are responding to COVID-19 natural disaster, won't wait until we have, the we have the recovery from the pandemic. It does not wait. They will become threat multipliers and at the very least roll back the development gains we have earned and, and worked hard for over the past years. Excellencies and colleagues, there are, however, solutions at our fingertips. In our June 2020 statement on debt, EOSIS put forward a comprehensive proposal on addressing the challenges that SIDS face. One of the solutions was debt for climate swap. Today's side event is taking place in the midst of a flurry of discussions on debt. Just this past week, the IMF and the World Banks in, in, in indicated they would be organizing a framework for, for connecting debt relief to investment on um, the combat of climate change and to reduce uh, fossil fuel uh, emissions. While this is laudable and this is a, a very welcome news, this has to be built on lessons learned, be a country driven program and be embedded in a comprehensive approach to addressing the challenges we face as SIDS. Excellencies, colleagues, we need all partners on board if we are to achieve a world that we envisaged in the 2030 agenda and the Paris Agreement. It is our hope that discussions such as this will create these solutions and, and lead us towards build peer-to-peer -peer learning and be a catalyst for change. This is the need. This is what we are hoping for. And our event today is another step on the ladder towards what we hope will lead us to solutions. I thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Webson. Uh, we certainly have a, an awesome challenge ahead of us that has been made uh, slightly more difficult by virtue of recent events in the region. So your intervention is certainly timely in terms of arranging this activity, and, and we certainly are grateful for the opportunity to express views. Uh, the next Contributor will also make remarks, and this is Under Secretary General of the Office of the Least Developed Countries, um, Her Excellency Fakita Okutumayo. We want to welcome her at this time and ask her to make some prefatory remarks. Thank you very much, uh, Peter. Excellencies, distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, Your Excellency Ambassador Aubrey Webster, Cabinet Representative for Antigua and Barbuda. 
and Chair of AOSIS, Your Excellency Diane Black, Plain, Ambassador of Antigua and Barbuda and Chair of AOSIS uh, for uh, Climate Change. Thank you very much for convening this important meeting. It is well accepted globally that small island developing states are amongst the most affected and most vulnerable to the ongoing and ever accelerating impacts of climate change. In fact, over three decades ago, they themselves already alerted the global community to what would be um, ahead and what actions was needed. They indeed for a long time already knew that we must address climate change. IOSIS and all other countries that have submitted nationally determined contributions consistent with limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius deserve our thanks. Today we have the opportunity to discuss and look into practical um, solutions to address a key obstacle to action, the lack of fiscal space for states to act. With them, the ongoing COVID pandemic and all the so its social economic impacts. The pandemic alone has had and will continue to have uh, this uh, even more critical an issue for which urgent action and solutions are required. Indeed, uh, the already close to unsustainable debt levels prior to the pandemic are now a real threat to an inclusive and sustainable development path in the city. A promising uh, action avenue for climate debt swaps. It is a well established um, fact that social economic development and climate action go hand in hand. It is a must that we foster synergy across agendas and between major intergovernmental discussions taking place across the globe. This drives work. Uh, the United Nations uh, Secretariat, at the request of the General Assembly, explores. Uh, through the potential development of a multi-dimensional vulnerability index. The index goal is to comprehensively assess vulnerability of member states and then to drive the allocation of development funds and program support. As I already mentioned over the past year, with the ongoing health pandemic, vulnerability has further increased. Entire formal and informal sectors of the economy have come to almost a standstill with the many social ramifications this uh, brings with it and capacity constraints have become highly visible. This perfect storm demands unprecedented cooperation and financing. At this stage, uh, the commitments by development partners fall uh, short of urgent needs and particularly so for the small island developing states. The need to focus and tailor our efforts on vulnerable states, including states for stress in the options uh, presented from the financing for development in the era of COVID-19 process. The options collected through this process and presented to the heads of state and governments included uh, climate debt swaps. Over the last year, OHR LLS has worked closely with EOSIS on debt risk. Through this work, several key solutions to debt sustainability were built. Climate debt swaps was seen as an important avenue for tailoring these efforts to see. This important collaborative work is ongoing and is also important for the successful implementation of the Samoa pathway. What is the situation we see? SIDS are moving from a liquidity to a solvency crisis. The ongoing economic hardship triggering a concomitant social hardship can only exacerbate the threat of climate change, natural disasters, and other threats. COVID-19 does not give them a holiday. Countries ever more frequently hit by climate-driven disasters find themselves in long-term debt traps. We know what the vicious uh, cycle looks like. External borrowing is used to mitigate the impact of a disaster. Debt servicing costs keeps uh, spiraling and the capacity to invest in long term, climate uh, change adaptation and resilience gets obliterated. Add to that the high cost of natural disasters, and we were uh, again reminded of this just last week with the volcanic eruption in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. And my thoughts and prayers go to the people of St. Vincent and, and the Grenadines and surrounding um, countries in, in the Caribbean region. So, with uh, each new disaster, financial vulnerability keeps piling up. At the same time, response capacities of SIDS weaken. 
climate action swaps have potential to break this vicious cycle. And this is very important as it is now that we also must act on the slow onset climate change related events since alerted us to way back at the 1994 Barbados conference. The degradation of coastlines, death of coral uh, reefs, salt uh, water intrusion to uh, freshwater lenses, loss of biodiversity and reduced agricultural productivity are only some of the slow onset impacts of climate change faced by SIDS today. Climate change mitigation, adaptation and loss and damage are recognized as the three main avenues for addressing climate change in the Paris Climate Agreement. We all would do well to remember that the more you save on mitigation, the more you must spend on adaptation. The more you postpone action on both, the more debt must be paid through loss and damage. Climate uh, action debt swaps could address all three given ambitions. The last conference of the Paris of the parties in 2019 included a decision to explore the potential for the Green Climate Fund to expand its coverage to loss and damage. We are eager to continue our collaboration with the Green Climate Fund, our donor countries, and all relevant stakeholders to advocate for and coordinate the practical implementation of concrete solutions for this. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, in closing, Thank you uh, for being here uh, for uh, such an important event. I hope we can focus our efforts on innovative and impactful solutions to not only keep SIDS afloat, but for the successful implementation of the Samoa Pathway to Paris Agreement and to keep the promise of Agenda 30 to leave no one behind. Thank you. Okay, and thank you, um, Excellency. Uh, we appreciate your intervention, and we turn now quickly to the first major presentation, where we'll see an overview of the debt challenges faced by SIDS, and this presentation will be by Yolanda Fresnillo, and we want to welcome her and, and thank her for the first substantial presentation of this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, Your Excellencies. Um, Ambassador, uh, distinguished participants, colleagues, thanks uh, a lot for organizing this uh, key event and especially for inviting uh, Eurodad and myself to participate. Uh, I'll go straight to the point as time is short and uh, the issue is complex. Uh, as uh, it's been noted already, small island developing states, while contributing less than 1% to the world's greenhouse gas emissions, are amongst the most vulnerable countries to climate change but they are also amongst the countries that are most affected by increasing debt vulnerabilities. This was before the COVID pandemic. The COVID pandemic has enhanced uh, these uh, debt vulnerabilities. Um, as uh, a Eurodad report published by uh, end of uh, 2020 uh, argues, uh, there is a compound impact, a feedback effect between debt vulnerabilities and the climate emergency. Uh, these compound impacts uh, of debt and climate are one of the main challenges that, to my view, uh, SIDS face uh, today. Uh, the impact of climate change is a key element to understand the increasing debt vulnerabilities in SIDS. Uh, for a start, uh, as reconstruction and recovery uh, after a climate uh, extreme event happens, in the absence of a multilateral agreed financing mechanism for loss and damage, uh, is mainly covered uh, by new borrowing. As uh, Her, Her Excellency uh, Fekita Moela Kautoa uh, just stated, every disaster means further that uh, vulnerabilities. Uh, this is no news for the governments of the small island development states. It's also no news for international financial institutions. Both the World Bank and the IMF have recognized in several papers that debt crisis can be triggered by extreme climatic events and environmental hazards. For instance, the IMF published uh, only two years ago that large natural disasters causing significant damage can substantially set back output growth uh, and contribute to significant rise in public debt. Also, the IMF recently published a report uh, um, analyzing how borrowing costs are also higher for uh, climate vulnerable uh, countries. Uh, 
this uh, higher uh, borrowing costs have been uh, vastly evaluated by academics, by CSOs, and including the IMF. Uh, and it's one of the challenges that SEEDs have uh, to make. Uh, one of the research made by um, civil society organizations stated that uh, the V20 economies, the most vulnerable economies to climate uh, uh, change, ha have been paying over $62 billion in higher interest payments in the last 10 years because of this uh, higher borrowing cost, only in interest. Uh, if we include uh, also private debt, uh, this goes up to 147 billion US dollars in extra costs for the most vulnerable countries to climate change. An additional uh, issue is climate finance. Uh, climate, climate finance being not only by far not enough to cover for the needs for adaptation and mitigation, but also for uh, loss and damage, uh, but it's also mostly delivered uh, in the form of loans and not grants. This is also feeding the debt higher. On average, only 3% of climate-related uh, development finance reported to the OECD went to small uh, island developing states uh, in 2017 and 2018, only 3%. Oxfam estimates that half of this climate finance addressed to seeds was in the form of loans and other non-grant uh, instruments. While uh, in average, uh, the non-concessional um, climate finance is 20%. For seeds, it's 50%. Um, the inexistence also of a debt relief mechanism linked to climate extreme events as the civil society has been advocating for a long time is also a factor that we need to take into account. We can talk about uh, this idea of a debt relief mechanism linked to climate extreme events uh, when it comes to uh, discussing um, innovative solutions. <clears throat> uh, also, as uh, you as you know, Existing debt vulnerabilities and increasing debt on sustainability is leaving countries in a much worse position to be able to invest in climate mitigation and adaptation. Let's see what are these uh, debt vulnerabilities. So on average, low and middle income seats for which there is data available at the World Bank and IMF database, this is about 38 countries, government debt to GDP ratio was about 30% in 2008. It raised to around 50% of GDP, so debt, public debt to GDP up to 55% in 2011, then up to 61% in 2019. But the problem is that between 2019 and 2020, uh, the um, debt ratio to GDP has grown up to 73%. This is one of the highest increases in debt in developing countries. While between 2019 and 2020, uh, all developing countries in average uh, had a growth of uh, debt to GDP uh, about six points. Uh, in the case of seeds, it was doubled. It was 12 uh, points. In, in civil society organizations, we also like to look at uh, other indicators as GDP per ratio. Uh, so sorry, debt to GDP uh, ratio is not, um, it, it can give us a misrepresentation of the impact of debt in a government's capacity to uh, deliver development, socioeconomic policies and, and, and social investment or economic investment. Uh, so we use external debt service government revenue as a better indication. This ratio has also increased enormously in seats. On average, from 9% of revenue being diverted to pay external debt in 2020 to 11% in 2019, and then further up to 16% in 2020. This is an average. There are countries uh, among seats that are spending 40 and 20% of their uh, revenue, of their public revenue in paying external debt uh, today. Uh, the, uh, the, the projections is that this will uh, stay around 13% in 2021 and 2022, 2022 sorry. Um, 
mainly collapse in the revenue, mostly linked to tourism uh, dependency, as tourism accounts for almost 30% uh, of GDP in average in, in seeds. But also the increase in debt service in the last years explains the deterioration of these ratios. Uh, the bad news, and I'm, I'm, I'm really sorry to be a bearer of my bad news, is that even if international travel is open again and tourism uh, gains uh, speed uh, again, it's going to take time to go back to pre-pandemic revenue levels. Uh, this situation is pushing for an expanding contraction of around 4.4 percent of GDP in 2022, which is really bad news in terms of social, economic, and cultural rights of uh, the population of uh, small island developing states. One of the main issues here, uh, as has been uh, stated by Ambassador Webston, is the issue of being graduated as middle income countries and therefore not being eligible uh, for concessional finance. Um, and indeed, those uh, small uh, island developing states that are eligible for non-concessional finance only are precisely the ones that the uh, problems with debt have been more prominent, like uh, Belize, Jamaica, Seychelles, um, Suriname, and, and, and others. Uh, if concessional finance is not available, the only option for green and climate investment uh, is more debt and more expensive debt. Debt payments will go even higher than expected in the context of increasing interest rates in the US that would make borrowing from seeds and from developing countries in general uh, even more expensive. As the UN Secretary General recognizes in his last briefing uh, on debt, there is a risk that many middle income seeds with very high refinancing needs in 2021 will have not the access to finance, financial markets at affordable rates. In addition to being excluded from concessional finance, only 22 out of the 38 UN member state uh, seats are eligible uh, for debt service suspension for the DSSI uh, initiative. 13 of them have requested DSSI. The result is that debt service suspension only covered around 8% of payments in 2020 by SEEDS, and it can potentially cover up to 5% uh, of debt payments in 2021. To sum up, as I uh, reach the, the 10 minutes that I was given, SEEDS face a context of more debt, more expensive debt, and no clear mechanism for debt relief or debt treatment. We've heard during these two days of the FFT forum so far by, from many uh, country representatives uh, calling for the need for the extension of the SSI and the common framework for debt treatment to middle income countries. But so far, no decision in this sense have been made. This, has, this is a call that has been there on the table since the beginning of the pandemic. Maybe these decisions are not being made because the SSI and common framework are being decided at the G20 with almost no participation of developing countries and definitely with no participation of the seats. Therefore, we need a, a, a debt architecture reform decided together uh, with all developing countries, including the seats. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, uh, Ms. Fresnio. I uh, appreciate very much your intervention and the very salient points that you've made, especially uh, struck by the fact that we are just continually kicking the can down the road and replacing old debt with new debt. We now have uh, Ms. Teresa Black, who is a research analyst, climate analytics, uh, who will give her perspective. Uh, and thereafter, we go to a general uh, conversation with our discussants. Ms. Teresa Black. Ms. Teresa Beck, I'm sorry. Thank you. Um, Excellencies, Director, distinguished experts and the audience, uh, thank you for um, attending this um, conference today um, and for the invitation from the organizers uh, that I can talk to you today through our work, ongoing work at Climate Analytics on um, debt, COVID and climate change. Um, sorry.
As um, the excellencies have already mentioned, uh, we have a very unique uh, landscape in the Caribbean. Um, they char they char char characterized by very unique vulnerabilities, um, mainly caused by the remote locations and small size, making them dependent on external financial flows, um, which include um, a high dependency from um, tourism, as uh, Yolanda, Yolanda already mentioned, and other, um, other factors. And um, also to uh, weather, extreme weather events and climate change impacts. Um, I'm just summarizing what has been said before. Um, we have a very high average debt to GDP ratio, reaching 70% for the Caribbean sits which is much higher than for other SITs and LDCs. And this causes uh, a limited fiscal space for um, coping with natural disasters, such as tropical cyclones and the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. Um, the tourism sector alone accounts for one quarter of the GDP in the Caribbean and uh, exceeding 40% um, for some of the more dependent countries in, in the region. Um, last, year's, uh, last year has shown a drop of 58% in total contributions of tourism to GDP in the Caribbean. And um, this has caused this and all the other factors have caused a decline by 12% in GDP in 2020. And current uh, IMF projections from April this year um, project only a, sm a slow recovery with 2% in 2021 and 6% in 2022. And as mentioned before, um, the SITs, most of the SITs are not eligible for concessional financing due to their classification as middle or high income countries, um, overlooking very acute vulnerabilities uh, which include the debt um, and also um, tropical cyclones. Which have um, social, physical and very high economical vulnerabilities um, to which are adding these vulnerabilities to the SITs. In this table, you can see um, on the first uh, column the annual average losses, uh, which if they're spread out, they would account for 4% of GDP loss each year um, by averaging over these 20 years. But um, as you can see in the second part of the table, so, uh, recent major tropical cyclone events have led to an average loss of 40% up to 100, 200%, um, as His Excellency already uh, mentioned. And um, the nature of these tropical cyclones is that these extreme events are very difficult to predict. We don't know the upper uh, limit of these uh, events and therefore they um, pose a huge danger to, um, to the countries exposed to tropical cyclones. Also um, GDP losses in sits in small islands all over the world are very high in comparison to other regions because of their small size, a major event is uh, affecting the whole island and uh, thus making um, coping and recovery very difficult. In addition to the already, um, already um, high danger of uh, hurricane cyclones, um, uh, tropical cyclones, we also, have um, calculated that we will face an increase in annual expected losses of 22% only until 2030. So that means in 10 years, we will already have to cope with 20% more um, losses. And um, this is only an estimate um, related to the climate change impacts on wind speeds, um, which cause major damages for tropical cyclones but also we should not forget that sea level rise and the increase in the severity of storm surges will add to these very high losses. Um, which you can see here um, in this table for some selected countries. 
based on a calculation of last year, where we already included some projections of uh, COVID recovery um, on uh, calculating these damages for the next 10 years from 2020 to 2030. Um, furthermore, tropical cyclones, the, the, um, for the forecast for this season, the latest forecast, with, forecast which has been um, released recently, um, as of this month, um, suggests a very high activity this year. This means um, that we have um, a very high accumulated cyclone energy, up to 180 in comparison to 106 in average in, in a period of 30 years. This translates also to uh, up to four major hurricanes in comparison to an average only 2.7. And these challenges are, are very urgent now. They, they add to the urgency to act and to uh, to invest and to um, prepare for these for this very um, high activity season, which is starting soon. So, the ongoing COVID pandemic and the long term effects, um, including a long term recovery, which is um, also very uncertain and increasingly manifesting climate change impacts, which we can already um, feel today, but which will get even stronger in the future with global warming, will add to the depth trap which the Car Caribbean sits are uh, in danger to face. Um, the Caribbean is also expected to face this high activity tropical cyclone season this year, adding to the urgency that without depth relief, uh, many public services, so including disaster risk reduction, climate adaptation and mitigation, and also the ongoing work and the progress already made on sustainable development will be on risk. So I can only add to what my former uh, speakers and their excellencies have said, that we have to account for these very specific high and very acute vulnerabilities where the Caribbean sits and that by this we have to we have to include this in the process of assessing their eligibility for concessional aid. Um, thank you for your attention and I'm finished now. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Miss Beck. Uh, this is a point at which we go into the slightly more broad discussion, and I want to thank both of the key presenters for giving us a fairly substantive basis on which to move forward. Uh, so we start with the, uh, the panel discussion part of it, which we, we call the, uh, the more interactive session, and we have uh, four, four discussants, primarily five discussants primarily, who I would have introduced previously. Uh, and I want to start with uh, Ms. Diane Blacklean, who is uh, from Antigua and Barbuda, uh, Ambassador for Climate Change. Uh, and I want to go first to you and ask you, uh, we, we understand that Antigua and Barbuda is currently looking at uh, developing a debt for climate swap with the GCF, which of course um, essentially attempts to respond to the problem that we've heard outlined today. So can you just tell us what does the debt for climate swap the debt for climate swap that is currently being discussed uh, cover? What does it cover? Okay, so thank you everybody and thanks for the invitation to participate. So, um, so Antigua and Barbuda is one of the few Caribbean countries, CARICOM countries with large amount of debt with the Paris Club. So our debt is focusing on um, working on a debt for climate swap with the Paris Club. So they have to be in agreement. Uh, we're working on this with our Ministry of Finance um, here and um, as well as the Green Climate Fund as a partner. So the idea here is to buy that debt at a much reduced rate, but it will be a conditional buyout of the debt. Um, conditional meaning that, um, I don't know if you know how the debt for climate works, you have to pay for it. Um, so we would not, the debt we have is a, a close to 
30 or 50 million. And of course, we're not going to be required to pay off all of that. But at the end of the day, whatever the final figure would be, that the government of Antigua and Barbuda will have to prove to provide evidence. So it's evidence based and it's highly data intensive um, that we are actually spending that money on climate impacts. So I'm not sure if anybody who's listening understand Red Plus. So Red Plus is a results based um, payment system for if you protect your forest for mitigation. And it's really intensive data uh, requirements. So um, for Antigua and Barbuda, we're anticipating not the same as Red Plus, but we do anticipate that there's quite a bit of data that will be required. So we have embarked upon a long um, journey to collect this information and to collect information on um, the impact of, we specifically focused in on the impact of um, climate um, impacts on the household income. So what, what does a family of three below certain income level, what are they paying? And, um, and how is it impacting on them personally? So the idea here is that the government of Antigua and Barbuda, they want to use that increased um, liquidity that they would have received. They would not really generate liquidity from this swap, really, um, because it's really old debt. But what they want to do is to show um, the Paris Club that both Antiguans and both the government itself is already paying, us, paying a significant amount of money um, for climate. So the ideal situation is like Red Plus that is results-based. So it will go back over the last X amount of years with, with all of the excellent data that you'd hear presented by previous speakers to demonstrate that we have been paying already in the past. Mm -hmm. So the ideal situation is for the Paris Club to accept our data. Um, of it needs external validation, of course, and then say, okay, fine, you have been spending all of this money and would not require any additional payment um, in the future. Um, if, so that's ideal. If that is not uh, what we have and we have to do future payments, we do have the modality in place nationally now that we can demonstrate and provide the evidence-based information on exactly how to do that. So one of the things for debt for climate swap, well, many of our islands have to understand it's, it's very data intensive and you have to show evidence and how you collect that data. That is something that is lacking in many of our countries. Um, so that's one area of it. So as we were negotiating this with the Green Climate Fund, we had to do our, our safeguards, you know, ESS and gender and, and those kind of um, things. And one of the things that came up, which was a revelation to us at the Department of the Environment, is that one of the issues that, yes, we're going to help you pay off the debt, but what stops you from getting into so much more debt in the, you know, in the future? So there's a lot of assumption in that question, which I won't go into because we don't have a lot of time. But one of the questions that was asked is that, how can you um, pay for your climate um, program going forward using something other than that? And that is when we started asking the question here, the DOE, and then we realized that almost every single CARICOM country, um, their major instrument that the government can process and the major instrument of financing that the government, like the enabling environment is in place, the technical environment is in place, the software is in place and so on. The fastest things you can process is, of course, tax and spend. And the second fastest is loans. And um, grants, equity, and guarantee is far behind that. So we don't have enough national. So if, when you look at all the potential instruments that are available, sorry, to us in our region, in our respected islands, we are not utilizing equity, we're not utilizing guarantee, and we're actually um, very bad at programming grants. And so um, one of the previous speakers said that most of the climate finance we have is loans, about 70%, yes. That is because we're extremely good at programming loans. And we have not put, all of our ministries of finance have a debt management unit, but they don't have a grant management unit. They don't have an equity management unit. They don't have a guarantee management unit. And the legislation required for you to program grants um, and those other instruments is not in place. Whereas in the, in the, the, reg, the legislation and the acts requires for, of course, taxes is in place and loans will be in place. So we recognize in the design of our program that we have to also look at the opportunity and the appetite of our Ministry of Finance and, and our private sector and seeing if they would like to build the capacity to program other instruments so that we don't find ourselves backed right where we found ourselves in the first place, which is why we're borrowing more money to pay off the old debt because we have not really diversified our options. 
Okay, Excellency, thank you for that very uh, comprehensive explanation of what this uh, debt for climate swap would be. Um, I just want to ask you about the role of the Oasis as chair uh, over the next two years in terms of tackling the CIS debt crisis. Can you just give us a, a brief background on what that role would be over the next two years? Sorry, could you ask that question again? Okay, I was saying the role of the OASIS as chair, because that will be an important role over the next two years. Mm -hmm. If you could just give us a sense of how that role will be used to help tackle this sit debt crisis that we're currently facing, which of course has, has grown worse over the past year. Right, so um, once we took over in January as chair, mm -hmm. we want to make it very clear that we, our platform is on implementation. We've negotiated, mm -hmm. we've negotiated, and what we've seen is that um, many countries are still locked into negotiation mode. We're in implementation mode. And we are collecting a lot of data and we're bringing awareness to the debt matter. And we're negotiating really strongly with our partners to indicate that we can be ready to do a debt for climate swap. Not only that, we can be ready to program other instruments. And so we're also lobbying our, our small island development states to say to them, um, if $10 billion was available to us tomorrow to program, we would not be ready. We have a poor implementation record in terms of uh, of island states, and we need to. Uh, we're trying to explain in a very nice way, without offending anyone, that we need to get ready. And we also have ideas and approaches that we can provide to our um, to our, the whole AOSIS group. We can share among ourselves, not just Antigua and Barbuda, but our AOSIS colleagues have very good case studies that they can use, so we can get into implementation mode and get our national. Um, enabling environment ready so that we can, in fact, program $10 billion. So in make sure if we have $10 billion tomorrow in 24 hours, it should be done because we said okay. we have a huge need, but even if it's made available, will we be able to program it? I don't think so. So we are also bringing this awareness of ourselves and what we need to do as AUS is to get ready. We have finished negotiating, the money is going to come, we need to get ready. So that's our platform. Okay. All right, Ambassador, thank you again. Uh, I turn now to Ambassador, sorry, His Excellency Robert uh, Ray, who is Ambassador, uh, Permanent Representative for Canada. And certainly Ambassador Ray, given the role that you and both yourself and your Prime Minister have played over the past two years in development finance, how your country is looking to address the near insurmountable challenge of the debt crisis that small island development states are facing knowing the compound impacts of climate change and extreme weather events. Um, a couple of important questions come to mind. The first one will be, what, some, what are some of the critical solutions for SIDS that came out of the financing for development in the era of COVID-19 and beyond uh, that was recently convened by Prime Minister Trudeau and Prime Minister Holness? Uh, what were some of the solutions that came out that you can tell us about? Excellency. Um, Excellency, I think you need to unmute. <laughs> yeah, you need to unmute. So I'm unmuted. There, I'm, I'm unmuted. Thank you. Good. Good. Not, not everybody mm -hmm. likes me to be unmuted, but I'm unmuted. So <laughs> <laughs> well, we thank do. You We're much. happy to hear you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. It's, it's been a long Zoom day for me, starting with Ambassador Ratray and I were on a call at 7.30 this morning. So <laughs> we've been uh, talking a lot about, uh, about our, our work. Uh, let me just say that I, I, I think the, uh, the issue of the small island development states was, was very much uh, front and center. I mean, partly because uh, Jamaica and, uh, it was one of the co-chairs with us, uh, so it helped to, to provide that focus, but also because I think there's a broad understanding, not only in the Caribbean, but also in, uh, in the Pacific that, uh, and, and a number of other small island states around the world, that there's a very special set of problems that, uh, that, that uh, these, these uh, countries face. And we need to be clear about what they are. The first is that, um, as my friend, the, uh, the ambassador from Fiji puts it to me, he says, you can go from uh, middle or even high income to no income in three days. Uh, because of the impact of, uh, of a hurricane, uh, the impact of a cyclone. 
uh, and and uh, as we've all as we've all seen in the last year, the impact of COVID. Uh, so we, we the global system is not attuned to that kind of a situation. The assumption of the global system is that everyone goes through a gradual uh, march of progress from being a, a country in, in the, the least developed countries to then moving into the next phase and then moving into the phase after that and after that. And everything goes well, everything goes up and then eventually you, know, you become a wealthy country. What we need to understand is that when I was a kid, uh, I don't know Peter whether you are familiar with this game, this board game we used to play called Snakes and Ladders, where you, you would go up a ladder and then if you were unlucky with the roll of the dice, you would go down a snake. And when you went down the snake, you go down to worse off than where you were before. So what we need to appreciate is that the world of the SIDS is the world of snakes and ladders. You climb up, you get stronger, you develop your tourist industry or your fishing industry and your combination of things, you diversify successfully and everything goes well. And then all of a sudden, wham, back down. Mm -hmm. And that I think is an experience that the global financial community needs to understand. So that our definitions of where and how aid should be provided needs to change. So for example, <clears throat> one of the problems we've had, and certainly this has been made very clear to us, is that the, uh, the DSSI program, for example, is not accessible to a great many of the small island developing states. Not, not, it is not accessible because Countries are too, quote, well off. They don't qualify for a variety of reasons. And that's, that means that there, there's, there's, a, there's a, a, an extra challenge. The second thing to understand is that the, if you like the architecture, the world of debt has changed. Uh, a, for a long time, the world of debt was one, one, shop, one stop shopping, the Paris Club, the wealthy Western OECD countries, that did sovereign loans. Uh, and that, that, that was the case until you know, the turn of the century. But then slowly but surely, it started to change through, through the arrival of two, um, two, two different kinds of players, two different players. One was China, um, but not just China as a government, but China as the home to a great many commercial banks. Uh, who um, have been lending all around the world um, to the point where an, an awful lot of sovereign debt is now held by either by China itself or more prevalently by um, uh, commercial banks, which are uh, state-owned enterprises in China. So they're effectively, they're controlled by the government of China, but the government of China says, no, 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 that's not us. That's, that's a private private company that's doing that. And then of course, the third is of course, private, private equity, uh, private companies, private banks, uh, commercial banks have been lending, uh, usually at higher rates, uh, at, at much tougher rates. But the reason that many countries like, will say, well, let's take on that debt because it's more flexible. That is to say there, it comes with fewer conditions attached, requirements with respect to transparency and, and, and so on. And so if money, is, if money is available, people will say, well, I'd rather pay a high interest payment rather than have to tell everybody what I'm doing with the money. So that's the world we're in. Pre, you know, as of March 2020, that was the world we were in. Uh, the world we're in now is you've got this debt structure, which is more complicated than it's ever been, uh, but you've also got much less revenue. Uh, and many, many countries have no revenue um, or virtually none. And their, their, their tourist income and other incomes have been dramatically reduced. All of which is a long way to answer your question by saying anything we do has to deal with these issues. Now, what we have proposed does in fact deal with some of these issues. <clears throat> the first thing we've said is the amount of debt has to be understood and there will have to be debt forgiveness um, in many, many cases. There will have to be debt reduction. There will have to be debt restructuring. 
And in order for all of that to happen, there has to be transparency and there has to be clarity about everybody being, a, being commonly associated by finding a solution. So the private sector, including the Chinese private sector, the government of China and the Paris Club all have to be at the table together, everybody looking at each other, everybody sharing information, complete transparency of debt. Easy to say, but hard to do. And the G20 has said it, and the G20 includes China, and we're going to be watching with interest to see whether or not that can happen. The, the significance of the, of the so-called swap is really that it's a, it's a way of restructuring the debt, and it's a way of getting access to financing that is now more broadly available through the IFIs, and, and, and through other institutions that will actually come with an element of concessionary financing. And that's what my the previous speaker, Dan, was talking about. And, and that's where our very strong recommendation to, to member countries is to say, is, is to recipient countries, is to say, you have to get your act together so you can take advantage of the full possibility and potential of concessionary financing because that in fact is what is gonna help with the rebuild because the rebuild will help in terms of the infrastructure and other, other resiliency investments that are necessary to deal with the impact of climate change. And the good news is if, it, if, it's, if, if people are negotiating properly and with as much help as people can provide in, in getting to the table, it will actually lead to a lowering of interest payments, a lowering of debt payments, and a, and a, and a healthier situation with respect to debt. But the, the, those are all the elements that are required to get to a solution. And uh, Canada is, is very much part of this process because we believe intensely that um, we have to respond in a, in a, in a, in the, in, along the path of solidarity we have to respond to the situation facing um, the Caribbean countries and many other countries that are facing these kinds of challenges. And, uh, and that includes access to the vaccine, which uh, I know that uh, uh, <laughs> people want to talk to me about as well. But happy to talk about both those issues. Okay, Excellency, you, you actually responded fairly well to the three questions that I had in, in that <laughs> one, which is, which is brilliant. So I don't need to raise those. Um, what I could perhaps do is ask you to speak to something that you probably have spoken to several times in this whole question of solidarity. Solidarity motivated, uh, why? Why is solidarity important? Or why is it important for, for you in Canada? Uh, you as part of the G7 or the G20, why is it important for you to ensure that these debt issues in small island developing states are, 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 it, are dealt with? Well, I mean, speaking very personally, solidarity is important to me uh, as a moral value uh, at, at start. Um, and I, I come from a political tradition, which uh, uh, Caribbean Canadians will know, which is one of, uh, of a liberal social democracy, where we believe in solidarity as a social value for our own country. Uh, but I also believe that it, 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 we can't just stop at our own borders. We can't just say, well, I'm going to take care of myself and my family, but I'm not going to take care of anybody else. That's, that's not an adequate expression of solidarity. But there's something else. And, and this is, uh, I think, where you know, we have to understand that um, solidarity is no longer just a moral principle. It's actually an economic principle. Um, we, we won't, we, Canadians go to the Caribbean. We, we, the Caribbean is part of our, our world. We visit and we have a huge Caribbean Canadian population, as you know, uh, and that, that number is, it's a permanent part of who we are. Uh, and so we can't, we can't just say, well, you know, we, we're gonna stop here at home because the reality is, is that, um, you know, we're not safe from the perspective of the virus unless we deal with the virus globally, unless we make sure that people are protected and the protection has to be global. If, if we had polio outbreaks in the Caribbean, Canadians wouldn't be safe. And that's why we've all said there has to be a universal vaccine program. We need to have universal vaccines. 
The same is true for COVID. Um, and and it's, 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 it's really, it's not even enlightened self-interest. It's just self-interest. We, we, if we need the Caribbean economies to be strong, we need them to be, we need them to be self-sustaining. We need them to be able to, uh, to, to, to provide for people. And it's in our interest to do that as a country, but more, but as I said, it's, so for me, it's, it's one of these wonderful examples that you don't always find these in life where self-interest and morality combine. And you say, I, I, I can pursue my morality and I can pursue my self-interest at the same time. And so for, for us, uh, solidarity is, is necessity. It's, it's an essential part of our lives right now. Yeah, and Excellency, that's a, a very important point you've made. And certainly we can't, we can't stress that enough. I'm happy to hear that that solidarity exists. And that, as you said, there's a, there's, a, there's a wonderful marriage that takes place at this point in time between personal morality and, well, public morality, one could argue, or international morality in that case. Uh, thank you so much. Um, hopefully you can participate further if we have the opportunity, because I'm looking at the timeline and it has become a bit challenging. And I think we started a bit late. Uh, I shall go now to um, Batita, Badi, Badita uh, Vichy, who is a Deputy Director of External Relations, Strategic Outreach and Partnership with the Green Climate Fund. Uh, Ms. Vichy, you given your role um, on the uh, swap with Antigua and Barbuda. The GCF has been thinking about and planning the use of GCF resources, like readiness or otherwise, in an innovative way to help address access for finance to SIDS and the issue of debt. Uh, so we need to find out from you, has there been any positive progression of discussions with donor countries on this most important issue of uh, the debt and the uh, debt for uh, environment, environmental debt as well? Species. And we also, you also need to unmute. No? Oh, no. Yeah, thank you. Welcome. <laughs> yeah, we're hearing you perfectly now. I think we had a probably a slight technical glitch there and we see if we can, can get, you hear me now? get you back. Yes, we can hear you now. Okay. Vision. Okay, great. Thank you. Sorry about that. Um, so before I I, um, I go uh, dive into the dead swaps, I think mm -hmm. um, just a quick intro um, yeah. for us in, in about five years, GCF has built one of the fastest growing portfolios on climate action and SIDS are an important stakeholder group for us, uh, both in terms of the history of the fund, uh, pioneering features such as the simplified access procedures, uh, innovative in initiatives, and also you know, the fact that GCF is one of the few funds that's accessible to countries irrespective of the income status, something that was mentioned earlier. So having said that, uh, the debt swap debt, for climate resilience all of that falls within our approach in terms of supporting climate resilient recovery in the context of COVID-19. And uh, this has three main components. First was for us to be, um, uh, from a management perspective as a fund, to be adaptive and flexible to help partners to continue programming because uh, this was also really important to promote liquidity to countries that are experiencing a significant financing challenge given you know, at the time the portfolio was 20 billion and now it's 30 billion. Second was uh, rapid readiness. And this is, uh, we speak to that in the context of Antigua and Barbuda where countries can receive up to 300,000 for green recovery slash stimulus, stimulus measures. And we've been in discussions with many of our country uh, partners to, to use this financing so that they can look at um, you know, crafting uh, stimulus measures that use non-debt financing, such as grants, equity, and guarantees in response to the debt issues. And I think, again, this, this point has come from Ambassador Ray, but also from Diane. And I think, again, increasingly how to build that capacity to look at other, to, to, to use other forms of financing, I think is important. And the last part is uh, through projects, because that's uh, where the bulk of our financing goes. And we've been investing in capital intensive uh, initiatives that create jobs, protect jobs, but also have high 
socioeconomical benefits. And in 2020, we had, uh, I think, the highest amount approved by the board. And in the last board in, uh, in March, uh, again, this was the highest board that uh, highest amount that a board had approved. And, and in that context, we also really like to thank uh, countries like the UK who've been front loading payments for us to continue with the high volume of requests that is coming from developing countries in terms of climate investments. And so I think country ownership is really key to address some of the capacity and investment needs, including some of these innovative uh, financing um, uh, approaches and, and, and initiatives that we want to work on, which includes uh, debt for climate res resilience. And so from our perspective, well, how it works is that it's a three-party arrangement among developing country debtor, creditor country, and us in GCF. And under this arrangement, the creditor government will transfer their creditor rights for outstanding sovereign debt into GCF capital. And then in coordination with the developing country, GCF will then convert this money into the local currency of the developing country and direct these funds towards climate uh, projects uh, in that country. Um, and this model presents a triple win situation for all partners for developing countries. You can help to ease the foreign currency denominated debt burden and convert it into local currency. And also they receive additional investments to help uh, promote climate uh, resilience. And for the creditor countries, it's another way to provide additional financial support for climate action. And for GCF, obviously it's important to be able to channel uh, financing for highly impactful projects with high standards in terms of transparency, environmental, social, and, and, and um, governance and gender impacts. Um, I think one quick point to say here, and I think this is also the discussion with um, contributing countries, is that we cannot buy debt. And I think that's a really important qualifier. And then particularly with Antigua and Barbuda, we're really um, excited to be pioneering this with them. And of course, as uh, Diane mentioned, um, this is about uh, the kind of, uh, I think the proposed arrangement is how we can help support or partially finance the redirection of approximately 147 million of debt towards domestic investments in climate change projects. Um, Antigua and Barbuda are developing a multi-year GCF readiness proposal. I believe it's coming next week. It's about, um, I think more than 2.5 million, which includes the whole debt swaps component, but I know there are other issues also there. And this would include financing in terms of negotiation with creditors, establishment of legal and contractual frameworks, reaching agreements with all relevant participating inst institutions, including with the Paris Club, and capacity building and inst institutional development of relevant, um, I think, national entities um, in country. And uh, again, as, as, as has been mentioned before, it's a lot of work. And again, building that capacity and support and that overall frame, framework and environment is re really important. And yeah. one quick lesson learned is that um, I think early discussions with GCF is important, uh, which is what I think has helped in this case in reshaping the proposal and, and you know, also minimizing um, some of the transaction costs around something that's so unique to certain to the, the, to the context of yeah. countries. And we do think that this example will be relevant for other countries, and we are anticipating requests from um, other SIDS countries to support, especially going into COP. I'm going to stop here right now mm -hmm. because I think there yeah. were some questions about, um, you know, for the investment, and I can go into that. Well, I mean, the the first question was the response of donor countries, uh, and. You, you've answered that to some extent. The second question would be what you just started to talk about. How can other countries who are interested in this type of swap um, get involved? And as, is there any uh, progression in terms of the conversation with other countries who may want to go the same road that Antigua and Barbuda has gone? Um, as of now, no. Uh, but again, I think this is, it, I, I do believe initially the Antigua and Barbuda ex, um, initiative was supposed to be a multi-country initiative, but I understand uh, through discussions among countries, it was decided that Antigua and Barbuda would go first, but from our side, we are very much ready to support countries. Uh, mm -hmm. But I do think, again, this is a good example, but as I said, we anticipate um, potentially another request uh, and hopefully, you know, that would be something good in, in, in the lead up to COP. Okay. Um, and the, the other question is in terms of the innovation of financial instruments that you would be encouraging SIS to build capacity and understand 
to broaden, deepen uh, their access to GCF resources? Uh, what, what are some of the uh, instruments that you would be proposing? Um, we are a financing facility also. Um, and so we provide loans, grants, equity, uh, guarantees, and including results-based payment. Mm -hmm. And we are capital agnostic. And so we are very much focused on what kind of finance is needed to close the deal. At the same time, I think uh, we provide what is uh, patient capital have a are more risk uh, are, are more risk inclined, and so I think that de-risking part is really important as we look at uh, risk reward profiles and and really helping to again catalyze the additional financing from both public and private sector. Having said that, I think again, you know, um, we are really looking at how we can support blended finance models that work for SIDS and LDCs. So coming back to the point by Diane also about, you know, uh, not just grants, but equity guarantees and being able to, to have very innovative uh, blended finance models uh, that, 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 you know, really can catalyze additional financing. Um, and in that context, we actually have some very good examples already. One is the Global Subnational Climate Fund, which is, um, which is uh, targeting 42 countries, includes a lot of countries in, uh, in, in the Caribbean too. And this, we had a discussion in the UN co-hosted by the ambassadors of Jamaica and ambassadors of Fiji and ambassador of, um, of Rwanda too, uh, because it's such a unique model and it's really uh, channeling equity at a subnational level. And in this, in this case, GCF put in 150 million in equity and we took a first, first loss position. And in that context of this deal, uh, $1 from GCF is likely to catalyze about $25 from uh, private investors. And again, this is for countries like SIDS, LDCs, and again, for us to show uh, these investments and to de-risk them is very important. And there's another really interesting one that's in development, it's the Caribbean Caribbean Resilience Fund with the IDB. Mm -hmm. I understand the Caribbean Development um, Bank and, 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 and others are all involved and it will cover resilient infrastructure, disaster risk financing and nature-based solutions. And again, these are also, I think, multi-country initiatives that can really leverage the suite of financing instruments that we bring to the table is important as we also look at innovative uh, financial structuring. And I think going into recovery and beyond, building that capacity, building that space and de-risking it, I think will be very important in terms of what the, what the fund can do above and beyond what others are doing. Yeah. I just want to ask you one final question, which is not on the list, but uh, I'm, I'm curious about the fact that the uptake has been slow. Um, apart from Antigua Barbuda, uh, is there a downside that you think that some countries are seeing uh, or alternatively, is it just uh, conservatism in relation to not coming forward thus far? I, I would like to defer that to Diane if it's okay, because even for <laughs> okay. us, this was supposed to be a multi-country initiative, mm -hmm. a couple of countries. And for us, it's always better when we work you know, with, with multiple countries. Um, but I do think it's a very difficult issue and it's almost, you know, again, it has to be bespoke, mm -hmm. uh, given the country's debtors, you know, the unique context of countries. Uh, but like I said, from our side, we're very open and willing to support. And again, okay. we are also learning in the process, obviously. Well, if I can, and I want to thank you for your contribution, if I can throw the question back to Diane, uh, and if she can, can give a response, and then this we continue. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because this is a conversation. Diane, can you unmute and give us a... Yes, um, thanks. Uh, yeah, so the debt structure in St. Lucia and St. Vincent, those are the other two countries are very countries? different. Okay. Mm -hmm. And um, so we had basically the easiest one to work with, whereas St. Lucia and St. Vincent had more complicated types of debt, like uh, mostly on the regional OECS market kind of debt. Um, so they needed a, a different solution, which we didn't have the answer for as yet. And, they, and their national enabling environment is not in place. So, um, so when we did an assessment of their financial architecture and enabling environment, it would have taken them quite a few years to get ready. Um, so, um, so we went ahead instead and then we're hoping to do ours first and then in our three year readiness that we submitted, we have quite a few um, bit of financing in there to, to pass down lessons learned to these other countries in the region. We're also working with the OECS Commission and they too are looking to, to get accredited as well um, so they can move forward. And, and frankly, the, the issue was that um, the DOE is accredited 
um, our accreditation level can only do one project at a time. Mm -hmm. Whereas we couldn't do, um, uh, it's difficult to do three countries because the accreditation level for um, five Cs, for example, or Caribbean Development Bank would have been the other options are uh, not at a level that three countries could work with. So that's, it's just simply like that, yeah. Okay. Okay, thank you again, um, Ambassador. I want to turn now to back to uh, Ms. Fres Nilo, who uh, set the tone very nicely for us. And I want to thank you for, for a very insightful presentation to set the scene for our panel. Um, the situation in SIDS is quite dire and AOSIS put out a statement last year on how to comprehensively address the issue of debt for our member states, they included an array of approaches that were to be taken together, including debt restructuring, suspension, debt relief, debt forgiveness, many of which uh, Ambassador from uh, Canada spoke about. Um, what are your top three concrete actions that you believe could be taken in 2021 to help address the issue of small island developing states and the role for the debt for climate swap in that mix? If, if indeed there is a role for the debt for climate swap. <laughs> yeah. uh, thank you. Um, I, I'll leave the, the role for uh, climate uh, debt swaps uh, for the end. Uh, mm -hmm. I think there are several or many things we could uh, do in this uh, short, short period or short term. But the first one, which is, I think, an easy and obvious one, as, as Ambassador Webster uh, mentioned uh, in his presentation before, it's the call for a change in country eligibility for uh, debt treatment and for accessing concessional finance. I think uh, the evidence is, is so... Uh, clear uh, that uh, we would need to push for for this uh, hard in terms of uh, both um, governments, uh, institutions, and, and CSOs. Uh, but the, the, as I said before, the calls for extending uh, or expanding uh, the DSSI and the Common Framework to middle-income countries, uh, it's not an issue of expanding, it's an issue of actually stop linking it to uh, GDP per capita and link debt relief initiatives uh, to the needs of uh, the countries. And in this sense, I, I really support and really like the uh, Caribbean proposal uh, of a new debt vulnerability index. This is in line with uh, CSO's proposals for an open debate of, uh, for a new approach to debt sustainability. Uh, we've been proposing for many uh, years now to evolve towards uh, a more adequate concept uh, of debt sustainability that includes environmental, climate vulnerabilities, human rights, and other social, gender, and development considerations. Uh, I think this could help us uh, forget about um, GDP per capita uh, as an eligibility uh, criteria. The, the, the second, as I mentioned, is the need to advance towards uh, international financial architecture reforms. Um, I know you, you, you said uh, 2021, but I think we cannot wait anymore mm -hmm. for those reforms uh, to happen. Uh, the pandemic has made more evident than ever the need for uh, deep changes in, in debt architecture, including in the governance of multilateral institutions, uh, the, as the unequal allocation of SDRs uh, recently uh, shown. Um, the, the, the IMF, the fund released uh, last October a paper on, on international debt architecture reform that uh, supported by even uh, the managing director, Kristalina Georgieva, with an article. Uh, but it was focused merely on the introduction of state contingent clauses, including hurricane clauses. Uh, and don't, don't get me wrong, I think uh, the introduction of such clauses can be very positive, especially for seeds and other climate vulnerable countries, but this cannot deviate any more the attention from the urgent need for a debt architecture reform. We've been calling for the establishment of a multilateral debt resolution framework under UN auspices that delivers timely, comprehensive, transparent, and fair debt resolution, debt restructuring, and debt cancellation to all countries in need, regardless of their GDP per capita, um, which should address also uh, systemic risks posed by unregulated and inadequate uh, uh, financial sector and the reform of credit rating agencies, for example. Uh, we are missing an opportunity in this FFD forum to advance towards 
this reform of the international uh, financial architecture. We would like to see in the outcome document a call for, for such a change. And then the final one, the third one would be advocating for an interest-free automatic moratorium on all debt payments immediately after a climate disaster. This is something we've, we advocated for in COP25. We'll, we'll probably continue advocating for this within the, the talks on loss and damage. It has a lot of potential because it can provide immediate access to resources that are already in the country in the aftermath of a, of a disaster. And then in addition to the moratorium that should be applied to official private and multilateral creditors, uh, we would need a pre-designed framework for debt restructuring after a climate disaster. This could be done within this debt uh, resolution framework that I was uh, mentioning before. Okay. These are all structural reforms. Uh, and of course, debt swaps have a role uh, in, in this. The problem is that the experiences in the past uh, haven't been very successful at uh, significantly reducing debt burdens. Uh, and, and I mean uh, experiences of debt swaps for development, debt swaps for education, for health, for uh, water investment, uh, as they generally cover too little debt relief. So progress on debt swaps shouldn't be seen as a solution for the profound debt crisis that the COVID-19 triggered, nor as an alternative for moving forward the, fun the fundamental reform uh, of the international architecture. Debt swaps cannot be a way to avoid debt restructuring. It ca they can be helpful for liberating resources for key investments, for climate resilience, for, it, for mm -hmm. instance. But uh, unfortunately, we don't see them as a solution for the debt crisis. Okay. All right. Uh, thank you for that um, pretty comprehensive explanation. Uh, we are now uh, in the final 10 minutes of the program. We have to keep fairly close to the, the time that's allotted to us. Uh, I want to turn now to Dr. Schlusler, who is the, well, silent partner uh, so far, uh, climate science and, and impact. We would have already had a presentation from Mr. Beck, Ms. Beck, who would have been a part of that exercise. Uh, so we want to thank you for the presentation so far. Um, it sent some um, time warning about shockwaves from impacts that we are yet to see in relation to uh, recent events. And, and you have written specifically in your own capacity on extensively on climate impacts to pinpoint sea level rise and even the climate impacts that have resulted from the COVID-19 pandemic pretty recently. Um, based on recent analysis from the NCD submitted and those indicated today, the picture is still very grim for SIDS. Uh, Ambassador Webson recently indicated that we are flirting dangerously with the 1.5 uh, warning limit. Um, so I would ask you, what is your current assessment of the gap uh, out to 2030 and 2015 as outlined by the IPCC special report um, and the current likelihood to overshoot this 1.5 target? Dr. Schluzer. Yeah, thank you, Peter, and uh, thank you for uh, uh, for this excellent question. I think it's a fascinating discussion, and I'm uh, uh, very happy that we can contribute with some uh, scientific analysis around the climate change impacts on that matter uh, to this debate here today. Uh, it is a very important question, and indeed, if we looked at the recent reports in terms of what we have on the table uh, of 2030 targets, nationally determined contributions under the Paris Agreement that have come forward uh, over the past month, the picture looks uh, bleak. Uh, however, I think there are some important uh, elements to be put into perspective here uh, when it comes to the much urgent need to push for more ambition to keep one and a half degrees within reach. So uh, where to start? First and foremost, um, we are not seeing yet the ambition to come forward uh, that we would require to limit uh, warming to one and a half degrees. If current policies as they're on the table or pledges are being implemented, we are looking into an end of century warming of two and a half to three degrees. These impacts will be very substantial. We also have done additional analysis, for example, what this would entail in terms of climate impacts and also on the macroeconomic development uh, uh, for small island states. And uh, this would, a three degree warming trajectory you're currently on would inflict about uh, a 10% lower GDP per capita uh, uh, 
range in terms of economic damages for small island states on average by mid-century and exceeding 50% by the end of century. So the economic impact of such a trajectory of the future of SIDS, not speaking of the loss of livelihood, sea level rise, loss of ecosystems and uh, unique and precious systems like tropical coral reefs is very, very substantial. And I can uh, uh, talk a little bit more about it. But um, on the other hand, we are seeing, to take us back to the mitigation question, we are seeing uh, promising developments in major uh, economies coming forward with net zero targets by mid-century. So we have more than 60% of global emissions um, under net zero targets or proposed to commit themselves to net zero targets by mid-century, which would uh, bring one and a half degrees within striking distance at least. So uh, the recent analysis of the climate action tracker suggests that under an optimistic assumption, this could lead to a warming trajectory of about 2.1 degrees. However, the near-term ambition until 2030 that we see or that we require to get us on a one and a half degree trajectory is nowhere to be seen yet. And this is the current struggle this year. It is still very much uh, possible to limit warming to 1.5 degrees. The climate science, the state of the science is clear on that fact, but it requires uh, emission levels in 2030, so a decade from now, that about 50% lower on what, than what we currently have on the table. This is a massive undertaking, a massive push, and uh, probably seems like an, a very, very challenging task. But to just put this number in perspective, as we've talked about uh, COVID uh, also a little bit, we did an analysis that we've published in a, in a high-ranking scientific journal called Science last year, uh, where we compared the economic stimulus packages that have been put forward by, in particular, developed countries globally uh, to um, recover from the COVID-19 pandemic-related fallout with the investments that would be required to put the world on a one and a half to be trajectory. And the investments that we, or the packages that we've seen are one order of magnitude larger than the investments that we would need to see in the next five years uh, additional investments that we need to see to put us on the one and a half degree trajectory. Uh, so limiting warming to 1.5 degrees is possible and it's very well within budget, in particular at this time um, where we need to reorient and refocus to also not just the national but of the global economies um, recovering from COVID to the COVID-19 crisis. And if you look around, we see a mixed picture. We are nowhere there where we need to be but it's also not completely hopeless and uh, particular major emitters and uh, a new um, political administration, for example, in the United States uh, are taking steps that uh, uh, might give us reason to be hopeful. And it's definitely uh, a fight for small island states that they cannot afford to lose. Okay. Um, and the other quick question I wanted to ask you relates to advances in not only uh, science, but also in modeling of future climate impacts, um, whether they be the slow onset like sea level rise or extreme weather events like tropical cyclone. Um, how do these play a, a, a role in the way that CIS can tackle the debt crisis and at the time uh, find resources to invest in building low emission climate resilient economies. Uh, is there a potential role for attrition here in, in this regard? Yeah, thank you. I think that's a very important perspective and I think it's, it's an uh, important and innovative proposal but also a very much needed proposal that is uh, coming forward there because um, the challenges that small islands face don't stop with COVID, they don't stop with the current debt, and climate change is an existential challenge for many small island states. And it's not just the impacts that are being inflicted by individual uh, uh, catastrophic events like tropical cyclones uh, that my colleague has presented upon, and the, we've done an analysis for the Caribbean, but similar scenarios apply to small islands all over the globe. On top of this comes... Uh, come additional impacts from sea level rise, from ecosystem losses, from also fisheries, which are heavily, tropical fisheries, which are heavily affected by climate change. And uh, just to put this in perspective, if you, um, what, what is required to adapt and improve climate resilience in small island states is also disproportionately higher given their unique exposure. The recent special report on the oceans and cryosphere of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC, 
in 2019 has estimated that to achieve high levels of adaptation to sea level rise, small island states need to, needed to invest several percentage points of their GDP in coastal protection per year. This is an enormous investment that would be required to fully adapt to the impacts of sea level rise and therefore climate change. That is a massive burden to the development of uh, small island states. And it cannot be stressed enough that small island states have not contributed to that problem. Climate change is a problem caused by big emitting countries forced on small island states. And the effects on livelihoods, but also the sustainability of the whole economies of small island states by climate change will are playing out already today, as we've seen in the analysis that we've presented, and will be playing out even more so in the near future and the far future to come. And therefore, even uh, under limiting warming to 1.5 degrees, building climate resilience and providing resources and coupling potentially um, a debt for climate swap uh, procedure as it has been put, uh, um, put forward here in an innovative way is I think a key component, a crucial component to allow small islands to take those steps because if they are not in the brought into position to adapt to the impacts of climate change and build climate resilience, the economic damages and the damages inflicted and also future debt uh, levels that might be inflicted by climate change will only increase in a dramatic fashion. Okay. All right, uh, thank you so much. Uh, we have a, a question here. We have. Well, basically, we've been told we have about three minutes remaining. We have a question uh, from Leah. She's asking the beta, how important is it to have a direct access entity accredited accredited to the GCF to facilitate the debt for climate swap? Is that how Antigua and Barbuda has been able to move forward initially? Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Sure. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Mm -hmm. So I think um, in this case, uh, we. It's the national designated authority. That's always the important focal point uh, in terms of how this is done. And um, the debt swaps being a little, I think, specific. Uh, and, and, and again, Antigua and Barbuda's uh, ex experience being very uh, specific. I do think that was an important factor. But again, you know, um, if it becomes multi-country, all of that, you know, I think, uh, you know, it, it's a different approach. But um, I do think that the most important link from a GCF perspective is always the national designated authority and, and how best they see, uh, you know, something like this uh, situated within the context of the country. Okay. And, and the final question um, is in relation to the Green Climate Fund. Uh, is it possible that you can provide a link for accessing information on the debt, the climate resilience swap, which is of course uh, a question um, that you can, can perhaps respond to um, by way of the provision of some kind of a website information or something like that. So the Green Climate Fund, can you provide a link for accessing information on the debt for climate resilience swap? I'll send a two-pager to the organizers and maybe that can go to okay. all the participants. Thank you. Okay. All right. I'm not sure if any of the presenters or any of the discussants wanted to raise questions with any of the other discussions or questions. Uh, we have uh, literally uh, three minutes. Uh, so if there are any of those questions, um, you can raise them now. Uh, I'm particularly keen on the question of the, the prospects for this initiative, um, which we were told earlier, is probably best to ask that coming on to the end. But I don't know if any of you wanted to respond and, and, and talk about the prospects of this initiative and, and maybe the next steps, or raise any other question that you wanted to raise with each other. So. All right, and if there, are no, if there are no such questions that I will, will probably go back to, uh, the ambassador and ask him if he wants to bring the, the um, discussion to a close. I just, I just want to say that uh, sure. from my point of view, it's been a terrific uh, conversation and it, it, it's, it's uh, you know, I think all of us go through a lot of these meetings every day, but this has been a particularly valuable one. Uh, I really appreciate the the, uh, the comments that have been made and the added knowledge. And I want to thank Ambassador Webson for uh, including me in the discussion. I really appreciate the, uh, the opportunity to, uh, to listen and learn. And it's been, uh, it's been terrific.
I also want to congratulate you, Peter, on your backdrop. You win the you win the backdrop uh, of the of the of the conference award. <laughs> I always have a little conference, a little one. A wonderful art you have on your wall. It's great. It's lovely to see. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, uh, artists from all over the world. None of them Antigua, unfortunately, but no, all that's, over that's, the world. that's very nice. It's very nice to see. Thank you. So you're yeah. missing one, Peter. You're missing one. <laughs> I'm missing one, yes. I have to rectify that quickly. Um, Ambassador Webson, I also want to thank you for, for selecting me to participate in this panel. I'm sure that there are several other hosts that could have done uh, a far better job, and I'm happy that you nonetheless um, uh, persisted with me in this exercise. Uh, this initiative, I think, is an important one. Um, it is always important when we come up with solutions. Uh, certainly, we from small island developing states come up with innovative solutions that help to deal with issues which are as persistent as, as, as debt. Uh, so certainly you, you should be congratulated uh, in the role of chairmanship uh, for coming up with this idea and, and for pursuing it. And I certainly would want to wish you well as, as it goes forward. Um, and I turn the uh, chair over to you now, sir, and ask you to give some closing remarks as we bring the session to an end. First of all, thank you very much, Peter, and thank you for giving us your time. Um, this is, I hope, the beginning of a really close relationship and a friendship that we will build from here. So thank you. I listen to you, as I said, often and have been reading your stuff often. So very well. We are very pleased that you've joined us. Our effort here at AOSIS and our effort in, 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 in going forward on this is about finding solutions, as Diane, my colleague and friend, said. We are into implementation. And as Bob, my friend from Ambassador of Canada knows that we've been talking about finding solutions because we have done a lot of talking. COVID-19 and the pandemic gave us the moment for reflection and a moment to discuss and stop and think and talk. We did that and we are now into what are the answers and how do we pick up the pieces to rebuild our tiny island nations that have been so badly crushed. I want to thank everybody for their input. Bob, thank you for an, an outstanding input and clarity in the way you presented following up on the discussions that we have been having for the past 12 months or so with Canada, Jamaica, and the Secretary General. And as we are moving closer with the G20 and the, and the partners and G7 to get to answers that will help SIDS and particularly those SIDS that are defined as middle income. We thank all of you from the different organizations, Green Climate Fund and, uh, <clears throat> and our other partners who are here with us for your input and for sharing. And this continues to be part of the process where we want to thank my colleagues um, of the, uh, on staff who helped who put this together and helped to bring us here. And, and again, it is another step on the building blocks. And we look forward to the continued development of this until we find true answers that people on the ground in our islands can reflect and rebuild their lives. Thank you so much. i just ask you one last thing, spare a thought, continue to remember and visit the, the CARICOM sites to find information for the, to, to assist our brothers and sisters in St. Vincent as they are going through the immediate disaster as we face them every day. This is one that is upon us as we speak. Thank you very much. Well, just on that score, we just, uh, I just got word uh, on my phone today, just this, right now that uh, we, Canada has just sent a, a Navy ship uh, with supplies to the, uh, to the island. It should get there within a day or two. Thank you very much, Bob, for that. It's always very good to work with you, especially Canada has been very responsive to the disaster appeals that we have made. And that you and you, you and I know that and your predecessor, and we have worked really closely through COVID, through the hurricanes, and now through the volcano. We really appreciate the effort and the friendship. So thank you again, colleagues, and keep going. We move forward to the next step. Okay. All right, so thank you, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we, we end on a, a positive note. Um, Ambassador uh, Ray from Canada has just advised us that there's some, there's some help on the way for Venice for St. Vincent, that's greatly needed. Of course, the St. Vincent situation is, is not one of climate change, but another, nonetheless is one of a, of a climate reality. 
that we have to address really quickly. Um, special thanks to Francis Fuller, who did some of the legwork in organizing today's session. Um, ladies and gentlemen, good, good afternoon. And I want to thank you all for participating and uh, have a good evening. Sure. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, thank you again, you very much. Yeah. Okay, my pleasure. Thanks. Thanks.